grateful for the day that you have blessed us with. We're so very appreciative of the opportunity that we have to wake up and enjoy this beautiful creation once again. We're grateful that we have a moment to gather here this morning and to study and learn from your word as we prepare to worship you in the next coming hour. Dear Lord, we are grateful that we live in a country that allows for us to do such without fear of persecution, without fear of imprisonment uh, for being able to worship you. And we're grateful for the freedoms that we, are pro- that we are provided for that allow for us to do so. We're mindful at this time of those who are struggling with illnesses. We're especially mindful of Mr. Robert as he continues to recover from his surgery. Help him to not only have a speedy recovery over the next few weeks, but to continue to go about his normal walk of life uh, as time goes on. Dear Lord, we're mindful as well of the uh, Sisk and Howard family uh, and the passing of Miss, Miss Jerry. We're grateful for the many years that you gave uh, to us with her. We're mindful also of the great reward that awaits her. And so we're grateful that all, although we experience the pain and suffering on this side of things, that she is experiencing the glory that is promised to each of those who, who fall in line with your word and who submit to your will. Dear Lord, as we prepare our hearts for this class, help us to Set aside the struggles and the issues of this world and help us to focus and meditate upon your word and to grow from it and be strengthened by it. Dear Lord, we we are studying through the nature psalms and in doing so we hope that we can help to focus ourselves, our hearts, if you will, upon the beauty of your creation and the majesty that is shown within its great existence. We're grateful for the time and effort that you took to create this world and to give us life within it not only to give us life, but to sustain this world, as well as to grant us another day to enjoy it. Dear Lord, you might not bless us with another, but let us always focus upon and always meditate upon the great gift that today is, and use it not just as a day of worship and a day of glorifying of your name, but also as a day of reaching out to others and showing your love to them in the same way you have shown it unto us. We pray all these things in your Son's most holy name. Amen. All right, so it's been a few weeks since we have talked about nature psalms. Anybody go catch lightning bugs in jars over the past couple weeks? Blow in the dandelions a little bit? Fight cicadas left and right yet? <laughs> They've been popping up like crazy. What's been getting us is the, uh, are the is it water bugs? Is that what they, I mean, I don't know. I thought they were mosquitoes, but apparently dad told me they don't bite me. So I don't know. They hadn't bit me yet, but they're everywhere, everywhere in our yard, but Uh, I hope that we have at least taken some time to experience God's creation a little bit better. And if not, let us use this this study today as a way of rejuvenating that love that we have for God's creation as a way of approaching uh, His throne with grace and thankfulness. What's that? Maybe so. I don't know. I call them them, uh, flies that are everywhere in my house. (laughs) They look like mosquitoes, but they're, they're, they're not as dangerous, I guess, if you will. Let's open to Psalm uh, 19. Uh, We talked a little bit uh, last week. You know, I'll remind us of the nine categories. We might, might get through the nature psalms today uh, and get into the Word of God. Uh, However, I don't know. I've got the PowerPoint ready in the event that we do. We talked a little bit about the the focus of Psalm 8 and this exaltation of God. And they're talking about how even, um, even the innocence of a child... Uh, can, can recognize the beauty of God's creation. We referenced uh, here also Matthew uh, chapter 21 and verse 16 and talking about Jesus' focusing upon um, the, the mouth of infants or the, the words or the focus of infants and how God himself is even glorified within it. And we even mentioned the, the beauty of, of verse 1 and verse 9 and how they play so closely in together. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Uh, Excuse me, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who have displayed your splendor above the heavens, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And uh, so we focused in Psalm 8 last time, looking at praise and then a focus on God's creation, a focus on man's response to God's creation, and then once again a conclusion in verse 9 with more praise. Let's get over to Psalm 19. Uh, I mentioned this is, this is probably one of, the, one of the more well-known or one of the more well-quoted of the nature psalms, if you will. I'm going to go ahead and, and start reading for us a little bit in, uh, in Psalm 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, 
and their expanse is declaring the work of His hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them He has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of, this, of His chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. I want us to notice, if you will, when it comes to these nature psalms. The nature psalms serve as witnesses to God's creation. If you were to continue uh, in reading in verse uh, in verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the, of the Lord are right. Rejoice the heart. Uh, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, much more fine than gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping there is great reward. And keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of my hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. One of the interesting things about this psalm is it demonstrates not just one, but two categories of Hebrew literature, Hebrew poetry, if you will, in, uh, in one poem. Uh, two categories, if you will, in one poem. Uh, nature psalms are mentioned in verses 1 through 6, as we saw here, this, this focusing upon the, the sun and, and the heavens, which declare the uh, glory of God, this, that, and the other. But the second half of the psalms, uh, verses 7 through 14, uh, focus upon this, this concept of the word psalms. The author is balancing two ideas within this poem in order to make one singular point. In verse 1 through 6, he shows that man can acquire knowledge of God through the physical universe as, uh, as he uses nature, uh, as, as he uses the nature style of psalms to both recognize and to express this. In, Psalm 7, uh, in verse uh, 7 through 14, he concludes that man can also acquire knowledge of God through instruction from the law, through the use of the word as, as a type of psalm here. And his point is that one can know God from both the physical or the moral realm, and without the light from the sun or the light from the spiritual revelation, all life would fail. So I want us to notice uh, concerning a few things here. When we look back at things like verse 1, of 19. You'll notice the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hand. He, uh, in, this, in this nature psalm, is personifying the heavens as someone who is, by sheer presence, making a declaration of God's glory and power. Today we are able to count and measure the stars and so our awareness of them only magnifies this declar uh, declaration. Uh, he's got a little note here. Jewish mathematicians at the time could not count as far as we can see, uh, as we can with today's math, giving us an even further uh, expanse of knowledge of the stars and therefore an even further declaration of God's glory. So in doing so, he mentions the heavens are telling of the glory of God in the same way that you might you know, say, well, so-and-so told me or so-and-so said something to me. He says that the heavens themselves, the, the sky itself, uh, is, is a telling, especially the, the beauty of the stars, is a telling or a declaration of the Lord's uh, love and power, which I think is a very beautiful thought. Uh, and I think that's probably why this is one of the most quoted is this concept here in verse 1, that the heavens declare, or the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Notice as well in verse 2, day to day uh, pours forth speech and night reveals knowledge. This declaration of glory goes on from day to night to the following day as each array of the moon and stars is followed by the great sun in order to continue this declaration without, ce uh, without ceasing. Notice as well the synthetic parallelism. If you, if you 
kind of put in layman's terms or, or kind of slow down, if you will, for us to grasp what he just said or, or pointed out here is that especially here, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. It's this, it's, it's always happening. At the end of each day comes what? Night. At the end of each night comes what? The beginning of day. And then when that day ends, what comes forth? Night. And if the day and the night both declare the glory or the, or the majesty of God, then what happens on a continual basis? The declaring of the glory and the majesty of God. The moment that the day ends in all of its glory and, de and declaration of majesty of God, the night begins and brings forth its own declaration in a different way, but similar, yes. And so it's just continual process, day in and day out, constantly. And, and one thing that I find absolutely beautiful about that is if you look to some of the teachings of Jesus and you look to, of course, some of the teachings of Peter and Paul as they continue to, to write uh, throughout the Gospels and the different epistles, this, that, and the other, is, is you see this focus on constant meditation upon God's will, both constantly seeking after uh, a relationship with God yourself as, as well as constantly seeking to uh, further others' relationship with God and, of course, your relationship with others. It's this constant unity and God did not just set this as a precedent for us, but God has set this as a course of nature. The creation itself, not just the created, but the creation that we inhabit, the earth itself, the, the, the space that is around us or the universe that is around us, is constantly, perpetually declaring the glory of God within its creation. And we are no different in our, uh, in our need for declaration we are to be in constant declaration of God's majesty and glory. Now we do that in two ways. One is just simply by existing. You know, the, the, the beauty, the magnificence of, of God's creation um, and, and just how absolutely beautiful and wonderful it is to see all that God has created within the human body is a declaration of His majesty. However, we can also do that in a verbal sense or do that in a, in a, as a way of action or by way of action. Notice, if you will, in verse, uh, verses 3 and I said 4a, the, the first half of verse 4. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. Notice the celestial bodies, they do not speak. These, these personified heavens do not speak words or make any kind of noise that we can hear, but their witness is universal. Everyone sees them, and the message is the same in every language. Uh, the stars don't declare the glory of God in English only. It's basically what is being said here. Uh, to put it simply, it, it can be witnessed and seen by every man uh, and every woman for eternity with no language barrier. They can look and see the majesty or the beauty of God. Uh, without even the need. And you'll notice even in the second half of verse uh, 4 and continuing, it says, In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the, end of the, to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The greatest of witnesses that we have, at least that we can see, is the sun, which, is, uh, which the author says is like a bridegroom in his brilliance and beauty. The sun was not to be worshipped, but rather a mighty witness each day as it, is, as it covers the sky, hence the word, the, the tent, uh, word used in uh, the second half of verse 4. Uh, of God's uh, power and of, of his presence, visible and needed by every creature. So basically what is being said in verses 4b through 6 is this concept of, of although the sun itself is not to be worshipped, the sun itself, in a sense, worships God, glorifies God, magnifies God, and declares it. And, and the, the beauty of it, of the sun, as being probably the most majestic or the most powerful of the things that we can look to as, as a declaration of God's uh, love and presence and action uh, in, in His creation, is that life on earth is sustained by the presence of that sun. So it's not meant to be as a way of us worshiping it, but it's meant to be as a way of saying that God has given us this thing that helps to uh, supply life. In the same way that we shouldn't worship food or worship water, but we understand the necessity of each of those things within our lives. 
The same thing goes here uh, for the, the, the son. I find it very beautiful, too, that once again, I, I love his, his, his use of language here and the concept that he points out of this. There's no language barrier. There, there, there's no issue with, with language and, and declaring the glory of God. It's not making sure that we have you know, the right language, tra- the Bible translated within the right language. It's simply looking to God's creation itself as a way of being a great witness uh, to that. Uh, through, uh, the, this thought of light from the sun serves as a bridge to the next passage where the, offer, uh, where the author describes the light that also comes from Scripture. And we will talk about that a little bit in just a second. Uh, any thoughts on this, on this section before we move on to the next section? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, you, you think about uh, just the, the, the beauty, even in Scripture, of those moments that, that are described. You know, that, that we, we understand, of course, that the, the sun stands still and that we rotate around it. Um, uh, but, you know, it's just, it's just this beautiful concept, even in Scripture, of, of seeing uh, God's power over His creation. Um, I, I want us to be reminded, and, and I, I tried to keep it at the forefront of my mind uh, over the past week. And, uh, you know, as, as many of us do, or it may just be a me thing, I forget at times. Uh, I'm forgetful at times. So I try to remember and try to keep things at the forefront of our minds because I think it's a very powerful, beautiful point that was pointed out to us in Psalm uh, chapter 8. As far as creation itself is concerned, we are pretty minute. We're pretty small. In, in reality, you, know, you look at the even just the planet that we live on and, uh, you know, go out in your yard and, and look at the trees that are behemoths in comparison to you or look at to the to the rolling hills or the mountains or to the uh, caves or the caverns or the, or the water or the ocean itself, the rivers or the creeks, the oceans. And then that's just on on Earth, you know, and then you look out into the stars and then you see the other planets and you see the moon and you think, as far as creation is concerned, we're pretty small. And yet God has chosen us as, as, his, uh, as his most magnificent of creation. Uh, you know, it is not the, the world uh, that he saves, it is man that he saves. It is not the, the creation itself, it's the created uh, us as, as his creation. Let's notice, if you will, uh, what nature psalms are often used for. Um, probably the, the easiest to point out, if you will, would be that of praise. Um, especially when you, when you look at Psalm 8 and Psalm 19, that's, that's, that's the general message, if you will, is praise and adoration of God. Another is of apologetics, the, the proving or the reaffirmation, if you will, of the presence of God. Others serve as reminders. You know, we mentioned... Uh, that sometimes we can be forgetful at times of certain things uh, that we're to focus on, and, and God's creation acts as uh, a reminder. Um, we're not going to take the quiz, so if you will, go ahead and move us over. You're more than welcome to. Visit BibleTalk.tv uh, backslash nature uh, dash psalms. Um, but we're not going to take the quiz this morning. Um, however, I do want us to kind of t- to focus as he's swapping over to... Uh, The word psalms, which is the second half of Psalm 19. Um, How beautiful God's creation is. It's used as a way of of praise. It's used as a way of apologetics. It's used as a way of reminding us of God's creation. Um, Very quickly, you can be reminded of the power of God. One of the things that makes Sydney the most nervous is for me, I don't know why I've always loved it. For me, I love thunderstorms. I mean, I eat them, not as much lightning, but I love thunderstorms. And at times uh, when we lived in the environment where we lived, we had these, these giant pine trees that just towered over our house. And one of my favorite things to do would be to go stand outside underneath those pine trees and just, just watch as the sky would light up and you'd hear the sound of the rumble and you know, it'd be pouring down rain in Sydney. It's like, what, what, are you, what are you doing? You know? But for me, it's just one of the most beautiful moments. And you, you know, you think about how, uh, how, how powerful even just that, that thunder sounds, the rumbling 
uh, if you will. And it just, it's a little reminder. And the other night, uh, when, when it started storming in town, the field across the street from our house got struck by lightning and lit our house up very brightly and, and made it a loud noise. And you get a little reminder of how, how small you are in comparison to nature at times. And and therefore, as well, how powerful God is. And I think that's important for us to understand and, and remember is God's creation, not just man itself, but God's creation. As, as we leave this building that uh, was made up of materials that God created, but was put together with the hands of men, which coincidentally are also a creation of God. Uh, but as we leave this building, we enter out into the world and, and uh, leave this building and enter out into God's creation. Just take moments, little moments of time to be... Uh, reminded of God's power, uh, to be shown of his presence or his, his uh, strength uh, as the form of apologetics, and to take those moments as a moment of praise, if you will. Let's get into word psalms. Um, uh, of the nine categories, if you will, we are on number three. We started with wisdom, uh, focused a lot on, on focusing on the, the, the uh, Mention of, of God's word as well as what that means to man. You know, this wisdom literature, how can a righteous man live in an unrighteous world? Or what is it that a, a righteous man can do or seek after in order to live righteously in an unrighteous world? Then we looked at nature psalms, the focus in, in Psalm 8 and the first half of verse, uh, uh, the first half of Psalm 19, in looking at the beauty of God's creation. Now we're going to look at the word itself. Uh, word psalms are psalms that praise God for specifically uh, His revelation to us through His Word. Um, notice, if you will, as we continue in Psalm 19, uh, we'll look at verses 7 through 8 here in just a second. Um, a little note from Mike here says, Aside from the use of parallelism, authors also inserted multiple synonyms for the term Word of God as a device for denoting reverence, when writing about this specific topic. And we'll get to those as we cover them. But notice, let's read, if you will, uh, together, uh, Psalm 19, verses 7 and following. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Notice the descriptions, if you will, given to the uh, law of God or the word of God. We notice back in verse 7, the use of the word law. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring of the soul. In the second half of verse 7, we also recognize the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. In verse 8, we see the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. In the second half of verse 8, we see the commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. And notice also in verse 9, uh, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, as well as the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. When we focus upon the things like the law... The law is referencing or focusing upon making light of the commandments and rituals given by Moses within the Pentateuch or within the Torah. Uh, the testimonies, if you will, are things that the Word has spoken about. For example, God, salvation, relationships, creation, etc. The precepts are making reference to rules or guidelines. Commandments are the general principles that encompass everyone and, if violated, affect everyone. We see this often in the phrases like, thou shalt not. For instance, thou shalt not steal. That does not just affect you, it affects someone else. Uh, the fear, that is the thing that God's Word produces, which is said to be the same thing as the Word itself. A literary device um, that is used here uh, for the word crown is in reference to the king himself. Fear also suggests an idea of all reverence and uh, religion produced by the word. And judgments and or ordinances, depending on your translation, the sum and total of his word, the summary and conclusion of what his word teaches. So within just these three verses, 7, 8, and 9 of Psalm 19, we can notice that what is referenced here 
is that the law of the Lord is perfect for the conversion of the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure in making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right in the rejoicing of the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure with the enlightening of the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. However, Yes, sir. The fear that is produced when one examines the majesty and power of the Lord. Um, not God's fear, but our fear of God. Yes, sir. Uh, notice, if you will, as well, when looking not just at uh, verses 7 through uh, 9, but also going down into verse 10, um, this is not the only time that we have a literary device used as a way of pointing out a message. You notice these descriptions are given of the word, law, testimony, precepts, commandments, fear, and judgments. But also there is value given to the word of the Lord. Uh, for instance, in verse 7, the description is law. And what is said of that law? That it is perfect. The description is given in verse 7 that it, uh, of, of the word as testimony. And its value is sure uh, or, or promised, if you will, assured. Um, the description given in verse 8 is of, the, of the word is precepts. And what are those precepts? They are right. That is the value that is given. Commandments given in verse 8. The value given is pure. Description given in verse 9 is fear. And the value given is clean. Uh, and we'll go over what some of these mean a little bit more in just a second. The judgments, if you will, are, true, are both true and righteous. Um, and then we also see uh, this, this used in the, um, excuse me, in verses 9 and 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, uh, much more fine than gold, sweeter than honey, also uh, the honeycomb. It's not, just, uh, it's not just true, it's not just righteous, it's not just precious, it is also pleasing. The, uh, precious and pleasing are, are helped to be added to in verse 10. Uh, and so you don't just get the description of, of, of what the word is, but also a value given specifically to that word. It's not just the law, it's the perfect law. It's not just his testimonies, it's the assured testimonies. It's not just precepts, it is the right precepts, or they are right within their uh, giving of the precepts. The commandments are, themselves are pure as well. The fear is clean. Uh, the judgments are true, righteous, precious, and pleasing. This word perfect here as it does in elsewhere in Scripture, it means complete, lacking in nothing, exactly as God had intended it to be. The word sure here is dependable, accomplishing what God wants. The word right comes from the Hebrew word for straight or well. The word is pleasing because of the righteousness or the soundness of it. Uh, pure gives the indication of no impurity, no mixture of falsehood and truth, it is clean and transparent, uh, transparent, not transparent. <laughs> um, the, the idea of clean is that there's no ugliness, no contamination, no uh, deterioration of the word. The word true, is the, it is the epitome of truth, something that is tested, something that is straight or righteous, uh, which is the next word, righteous. It is without sin, totally acceptable. It is precious, more valuable than any material thing. Gold was the most valuable commodity at the time. Therefore, we see the use of the word gold in verse 10 as a comparison. And included within that was it, uh, also the idea of pleasing is more delightful than anything consumed. The example used is honey. As it says with you, it changes you. Uh, it says with you and changes you for the better, for good. So each of these things are not just given a description, or the word is not just given multiple descriptions here, uh, but it's also given value within these descriptions. And so in examining the word itself, one can focus upon and one can see the beauty of his creation. Now here's where things get really fun. We don't just see descriptions, we don't just see values, but we also see purposes within these things. You notice the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, 
than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey are the drippings of the honeycomb. Notice, moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, uh, there he excuse me. In keeping them, there is great reward. So, the description given in verse seven, the law, the value is given perfect, and the purpose of that law is to restore. Similarly, in verse seven, uh, testimony value is sure. Purpose is to give wisdom. Uh, the description given in verse eight. Precepts, they are right for the purpose of causing one's heart to rejoice, or the side effect is for one's heart to rejoice. Commandments are pure and the purpose of enlightenment. Fear is clean for the purpose of assurance. Uh, and then you can also look at judgments. Uh, they are true, righteous, precious, and pleasing. Verse 11 there gives us their purpose, which is for protection. So the uh, things that are pointed out to us is that it restores the soul. It makes wise, excuse me, it makes the simple wise. It makes the heart to rejoice. It enlightens man's eyes. It provides assurance. It provides protection and it provides encouragement. A few things that we could note about that specifically is that in the restoring of the word, excuse me, of of the soul, the word accomplishes what it sets out to do and that it converts the soul. The person who knows and obeys is changed. It also makes simple the wise. The word is dependable. Even the naive and simple can have confidence that it will give them wisdom and insight. It makes the heart to rejoice. The word has the ability to cheer and encourage because it offers both assurance and comfort. It enlightens man's eyes. Man's sinful mind is cleansed and thus brought to understanding through the pure word. It provides a sense of assurance. Not only the word, uh, but uh, what we learn from it has uh, permanence within our hearts. Whatever we know and are assured of in the Bible will always be. It also provides protection. The word provides protection from spiritual death as well as physical dangers by warning us of the destructive uh, actions and repercussions of certain actions and attitudes. It as well as provides us encouragement. Uh, The word warns, but it also promises um, and describes the rewards awaiting for those who obey what it says. Sorry, I meant to click that one forward. So the author here in Psalm 19, uh, which without, without cheating, we should remember this from our introduction. Who wrote Psalm 19? He wrote the first 41. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You think you think maybe James might have been doing some reading in the Psalms, <laughs> maybe gaining an understanding. Who wrote Who wrote Psalm nineteen? He wrote the first forty one. He wrote many of the Psalms. David, King David. So the the author, King David. Uh, we can obviously tell not just from Psalm nineteen or the second half of Psalm nineteen. We can obviously tell from each of the Psalms that, that David has written his, his love and reliance upon God's Word. Uh, he, he has a, a very good uh, relationship with God. Why? Because he has built that relationship upon the precepts and the knowledge of God. The author here, David, proclaims the greatness of God by using various synonyms to describe his Word. In addition to this, he details the Word's value and characteristics as well as what it accomplishes in the life of one who believes and obeys it. So just by reading Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, we see all these beautiful things, that God's Word is perfect and restores the soul. It is sure and gives wisdom. It is right and and allows for our heart to rejoice. It is pure and provides enlightenment. It is clean and gives assurance. It is true, righteous, precious, and pleasing, giving both protection and encouragement. You'd think that maybe David would have a good understanding of what the word is if he's able to describe it in such beauty and in such detail. Um, I, 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 for one, at least, could benefit from having a mind or a heart like David when it comes to God's word. Um, you know, we, 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 we strive to study and to learn and, and learn more, but just the beauty that, that David describes his word with here is, is absolutely magnificent in my mind. 
Any thoughts before we get into verse 12 and following? That kind of shifts gears, if you will. All right, we're going to speed through this. Not really, but we have two verses left. Um, or a few verses left, and then we'll, we'll kind of make the conclusion here. Uh, verse 12 and verse 13. Um, a few verses, uh, verse 14 as well. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let him not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I will be acquitted from uh, my great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In verse 12, he asked God to forgive or clear him uh, from his hidden faults. At first, he acknowledges that because he is human, he is not always able to know how he is sinning and going against God's word. Uh, interestingly enough, this is also part of why you have, uh, especially under the old law, the, the sacrifices. Which we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. The sacrifices given for the unknown sins, the things that you did outside of God's will unknowingly or without intention. Only the Christian believer today can pray this kind of prayer because he is under the state of grace and as such is not subject to the condemnation of the law that charges a person with disobeying the whole law for an infraction against a single precept. James 2 and verse 10 helps to build upon that. We'll talk about that in a second. In verse 13, David asked God to restrain him from, from committing presumptuous sins. These are sins that he commits knowingly because of rebellion, selfishness, passion, or weaknesses, but not because of ignorance. The Lord does not stop us from these, but through His Word, our conscience. Um, he, he can help to, uh, us to be alerted of this danger. David also appeals to the Lord for help in not becoming a slave to the desire or weakness and thus sinning openly against Him. He knew the danger of these and he, and he knew that he needed to be free from any enslavement of these kinds of sins. So he first asked God for forgiveness of the unknown sins, the things that he, done, uh, he, that he did unknowingly, while also asking both for forgiveness as well as help in the things that he does knowingly. In verse 14, he prays that God will accept the psalm that he is writing and offering up unto him. He begins his poem by describing the quality and the purpose of God's word and how precious the produ and productive they are unto him. And then he then ends by asking that his own words be acceptable to God again. A balance of ideas. God's word to him and his words to God. David finishes with a declaration that God is both his rock, for example, dependable, solid, indestructible, strength, if you will, as well as his redeemer. Now the interesting thing about his redeemer is that the term had two references among the Jewish people. The first is the kinsman redeemer a relative that had the responsibility to act upon, uh, excuse me, to act on behalf of another relative who was in trouble, danger, or need. For instance, Boaz within the book of Ruth. As well as the second way that, he is, uh, that the term is used is the avenger of blood. This was also used, uh, also a relative who was responsible for avenging the murder of a, re a relative. We see Deuteronomy 19 verses 4 through 7 as well as verses 11 through 13. I'd encourage you to go and read those on your own time. Ultimately, God is our avenger of blood who will carry out our justice against those who have injured us, Romans 12, 19. He is our kinsman redeemer because he has paid our, our debt of sin through the cross of Christ, which we can see in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Okay, very quickly, I want us to flip. Excuse me, I forgot that one. Uh, I want us to flip to Psalm 119. We're just going to start reading and, and we'll get through the end of it eventually. No, I'm kidding. We're going to look at one verse today because the bell just rang already and that's terrifying. Uh, Psalm 119, of course, is the uh, longest book in the Bible. We're going to look specifically here at verse 105 in just a second. So I'd encourage you to look at Psalm uh, 119, 105. Uh, this is the longest book of the uh, Psalms. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. The Psalm is an acrostic because the first letter of the, each line and every eighth line thereafter begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We mentioned this a little bit in the introduction to uh, Hebrew poetry, if you will. Um, we mentioned this concept of uh, each section. I don't know if your, your Bible has... Um, little notes above it, but mine has the little notes. Uh, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, uh, Hevav, Zion. Uh, each of these are, are 
letters of the Hebrew alphabet divided. But even within that division as well, we also see uh, letters going in a flow uh, for each of the beginning lines. Of course, not in English, but in Hebrew. Um, there are uh, 176 total lines and verses, each of which that fall in line with this beautiful acrostic that God has made, uh, given uh, through inspiration, of course. There is no progression of thought, but rather a general theme throughout, which is praise for God's word. And in doing so, this psalm uses 10 different synonyms for the word of God, five of which we are found in Psalm 19. I uh, mentioned um, here law, testimonies, ways, statutes, commandments, ordinances, word, precepts, promises, and judgments. Each of these are used throughout Psalm 19 in a very similar way that they were used in Psalm Excuse me, throughout Psalm 119 in a very similar way that it was used in Psalm 19 to declare the beauty of God's Word. There's a synonym for the Word in almost every line. Notice in uh, verse 105, this, is, uh, this psalm is probably the best known as it summarizes the, the well overall theme that the writer had in mind for the whole chapter, which is, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Word psalms are meditations, they express praise and appreciation for the value of character of God uh, revealed to the word of man. What do I mean by that? I mean that the word itself is a declaration of the beauty and power of God within its writing, even in places like Psalm 19, which were, is where we began, and Psalm 119, which is where we ended, uh, both of which point to the beauty of God's word and his creation. Now, I sped through that one a little bit more than I do some of the others, simply because there wasn't as, uh, two reasons. One, there wasn't as much material on that, but also we focus a lot of that on that as we go through our own studies and, and our own preaching of the beauty of God's Word. Um, and so that's something that we'll continue to talk about elsewhere, uh, but not in class. Not next week, obviously, because we will have uh, the lectures uh, will be next week. Uh, but next uh, time that we do meet, uh, we will talk about the penitential psalms, the repentance psalms, if you will. All right, I appreciate your uh, letting me go over a few seconds, and I appreciate your attention this morning.